So hopefully you clicked on October Daily Participation and clicked on Resubmit. And in the text box, you can just type three significant things from today. So did England achieve checks and balances? So the previous day we had mentioned that Rome had different bodies within them that could check each other, but they didn't necessarily have a strong enough institutionalized system through a constitution to protect themselves from someone, particularly a military leader, from taking power. And so that created a problem that led to the dissolution of the Republic, or at least its transition into an empire. The British system slowly over time develops its system of checks and balances. And generally, we consider it constitutionalism because it would be set in stone that each of these steps that they took would set up permanent restrictions or guidelines for the government. An important distinction to make, though, between the British system and the American one is we have a written constitution, whereas theirs, there isn't one particular document that says constitution at the top of the title. It's actually a series of documents that happened over time. But a lot of the change that happened wasn't necessarily because of James Madison's concern at the forefront, like, oh, we need to analyze this situation as best as we can and come up with a good model. Uh, in the British system, though, developed over time and through a series of historical events. And much of it had to do with class struggle, particularly the fact that they started off with a monarch, so an autocrat, one person in charge. And usually many of the challenges that happen to a monarch come from the other nobility, the aristocracy, the lords and ladies and other nobles. And that's exactly what happened in Britain, when King John was forced to sign the Magna Carta, it wasn't an uprising of peasants with pitchforks. It was the other nobles who demanded that they be consulted and treated more fairly since the king continually was asking for taxes and soldiers to fight in his wars back in France. And so the Magna Car Carta was really signed under duress, and it was forced upon the king by the other nobles. It wasn't some major accomplishment for the poor. And the continued decrease of power of the monarch happened because they had to continually work with either the other nobles or the rising middle class, wealthy landowners, business owners, merchants, those types of people that had increasing economic influence. So obviously they were important as well to fill out the people, but also provide economic resources. And so... Then, of course, the middle class wanted to increase their rights and their representation in the government. And so the eventual rise of the House of Commons was a reflection of that. And that is actually the body that is most dominant within the British system today. And so really, the British constitutional system developed because of monarchy versus nobles and then nobles versus the middle class. So these various constitutional steps happened because of this class conflict. So you had the Magna Carta that was first. You eventually had the Petition of Rights, which was signed, taking some more power away from the king. And that was because Parliament would only cooperate with him to raise taxes and other things, King Charles I, if he signed this. And then later on, when Parliament basically, to mostly to Catholic bigotry, uh, did not trust King James II, they basically fired him and put out a search for a new king and queen, and they found King William and Mary, who were equally Protestant. They were relatives of King James II, and basically said, why don't you come rule over England as long as you pinky promise to be Protestant and sign this Bill of Rights guaranteeing, once again, that Parliament is the one that's in charge and that people have certain protections when it comes to freedom of expression and if they're accused of a crime. So really, these steps that were taken happened over a period of a couple of different centuries. They weren't all at once. It wasn't some inspirational plan like James Madison had. And even then, there were still a lot of governmental problems inside the British system that needed to be worked out. Uh, by the 19th century, the situation had heavily favored this wealthier middle class, and they wanted to make sure that they kept power. So Parliament, for instance, had never changed the map and the way that districts work out in the House of Commons. We have to change ours every 10 years after the census is taken. So you had some districts 
that had a member of parliament with only a few hundred people in, and then other districts that had a million people in. So it didn't really make any sense. And it seemed like it was generally meant to favor rural, large-scale landowners. And so in 1832, there was a great reform push through to change that. So that way the districts were spread out more evenly, although it wouldn't fix all of the problems because it wouldn't be until 1928 that all adults were guaranteed to have a right to vote within the British system. And then on top of that, the checks and balances that exist, they certainly do exist on the monarch because now, even though the monarch technically still has the power to veto and things like that, they never will because parliament has control over the entire budget. So if the monarch keeps wanting to get paid, they of course are going to acquiesce to whatever parliament wants. But inside parliament, there isn't necessarily a clear system of checks and balances because in the House of Commons, the majority party chooses the prime minister and the cabinet, and they are part of the House of Commons. So the legislative and executive branch are part of the same body. And so the prime minister, who is currently Boris Johnson, he not only is the head of government, but he also represents a little district inside England. So he is a representative, like a member of the House would be here, and he's the head of government at the same time. So there isn't a clear system of checks between those two branches of government. And the checks and balances that exist here also exist between the House and the Senate. These are two equal bodies. They both have to pass legislation. And that doesn't necessarily exist in the British system. Uh, the House of Lords has mostly been defunct. It has only basically a veto power in that it can stall legislation for a short period of time, and that's it. Inside the House of Commons, there's no check on pushing through rapid legislation because they have a much more disciplined party system. Boris Johnson is the head of the Conservative Party. If he wants a bill that gets passed, there's almost a 100% chance guarantee because he has a majority of the members that it will pass. He'll just put it up, there'll be a short debate on it, and then his membership will approve of it. And that will be enough votes to get it passed. And I said it's disciplined form of party system because, for instance, there are about 10 conservatives that didn't want to vote for one of his first proposals when he came to office. So before the next election, he kicked them out of the party. So that way they couldn't run for office again. So there is much greater loyalty to the party in the British system than here. So there isn't that check over pushing through legislation and rubber stamping it through too quickly. And then, of course, the, the final thing that I'll mention is is we also basically, in a way, have a, a system of checks in the fact that we also are a federal system. We have 50 states, each with their own government, that have basically any of the, any of the powers or responsibilities not mentioned in the Constitution, thanks to Amendment 10. Even though they do allow Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland to have their own little parliaments in what's called devolution, really most of the decision-making in that still happens in London. And obviously, England has the most seats. They have the most votes if they have a national referendum like with Brexit. And so England is going to be able to dominate whatever happens there all the time. In the American system, though, of course, each of the 50 states gets two senators. And all of the states get at least some electoral college with the smaller, less populated rural states having a considerable influence in the electoral college system. That doesn't necessarily happen in the United Kingdom, which could doom it in the end because there's an increasing push in Scotland for independence because of that. So that's all about did England achieve checks and balances? You can go ahead and submit your three significant points.